Welcome, morning. church. Well, I am glad to be back with you all, back with the family. Um, we're going to start off with some hymns first. We'll just stand up and we're going to just realize that we've come into the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And two or more of us are gathered in his place. Let's lift up our hands to him. morning one and all thank you so much for being here so good to see everybody and um, I just wanted to you know I don't know about you but when I wake up in the morning first thing I do is I read my Bible verse I have it sent to me every day so this came because you know this week I'm sorry I know um, for some of us in here we had to go back to work <laughs> we're teachers I know I know you guys feel really bad for us because we get summers off and we had to go back to work, even though you guys have been working this whole time. Okay, um, so we did. And so, you know, it's just trying to maneuver everything. And I am a self-diagnosed overthinker. 
So I overthink everything, and I <laughs> just get so much anxiety. So this morning, this is the Bible verse that came up, and this is from Psalm. It says, praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. And I'm like, whoa, that's those are words to live by. So I'm like, okay, I'm driving, and I'm come in here and I'm like, all right, Lord, I'm just going to go ahead and clear up my mind because I'm going to go worship you. I'm going to be with my friends. Life is good. And of course, those thoughts, that overthinking comes along. And I don't know if you've ever had one of these days, but every single song that came on the radio was like my favorite song ever. So I am just singing. And then the very last song when I pulled into the parking lot, and I think maybe some of you saw me just sitting in my car sitting there, was um, Fear Is Not My Future, You Are which is by Maverick City, which is one of my very new favorite songs of all. And um, just words to live by. And so I am so glad to be here with all of you. And I hope that you will join us after service. We do have Sunday School. And those of you know that Cindy Ivy is an excellent cook, baker, anything that she does is always <laughs> top notch. Well, she has made a delicious cake. And so absolutely, please come join us. Um, even if you don't stay for our fellowship, come and grab a piece of cake because um, you will definitely, it will make your day a little bit brighter and better. And again, thank you. Thank you so much for all of your faithfulness and your tithes and giving. And um, again, come and join us. And remember, let go, let God. Well, amen to that. We can all stand up again, and let's just continue in our worship to our Father in heaven. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong
you, Charmaine, for reminding us again. A lot of times we get, you know, caught up in the troubles of this world, and so easily our hearts can grow weary. God does not leave us there, right? He reminds us that again. He is good. And he is eternal. So remember that your momentary troubles are just that, just a moment. That we get to be a part of something so much greater. History, his story. So that we can be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And that he can use the good, the bad, and the ugly in our lives to glorify that one great story of redemption, of love, of God who saves us. Amen.
Santo Jesus. Thank you that there's no scoreboard, Father, of all the good things we do versus the bad. We know we can never measure up. Thank you for your holiness, Father. of our own way. we grow weary, we grow faint, we never do. So remind us to go to you, the source that will never run dry. Although our bodies may fail, although things come and go in this world, we never do and we love you. So we're so thankful for that promise. Let it be the cornerstone of our life. down the valley, let us please let us lift our eyes to you and know that you see us there and you'll work through those trials. When we're up on that mountaintop, God, let us give you that glory to know that you're the one that sent us there. So great to be a part of your story, Father, and we just give you all the glory. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, we pray. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for those new faces that I see out there, my name is Tim Crutcher. I have the privilege of just sort of temporarily helping to fill the gap here while uh, our community is trying to figure out uh, its, uh, its future. And uh, so it's a delight for me to, to be here uh, and have the privilege to do that. Um, I know that we have already, in some sense, you know, prayed a very worshipful prayer, but I want to, before we turn to the scripture, I want us to take a little bit of time as a community to remember our community needs and to spend some time praying uh, for our future. So I'd invite you to bow your heads with me again as we pray. Our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful uh, for who you are and for all of the things that you have done, the marvelous things that you have done both in creation and in our lives. And we are overwhelmed if we allow ourselves to think about the wonder of who you are. And Lord, when we do that, we often think that uh, how could we matter being so small and insignificant? And so a second wonder comes that even though you are so great and we are so small, you love us. You take time with us. You enjoy being with us. And you empower us to be a part of your kingdom and your work. And Lord, that is why we have come together today as your community, as your family, as your sons and daughters, so that we could receive fresh empowerment from you, so that we could recenter ourselves on you, and that we can be more of a part uh, than we ever have before of the redemption that you are working in this world. So Lord, we want to just take a few moments to open up our lives and our hearts to what that might mean. Uh, as a community, Lord, we find ourselves at a bit of a crossroads and we are in desperate need of your wisdom so that we know what does it mean for us as individuals, for us as a community of faith, to be the best part of that redemption program that you are working. So Lord, we pray that you would inspire and inform us with that. Give us a vision of what it is that you want to do through us and help us to be open to whatever that might mean. Lord, in the coming you know, days and weeks, there are going to be discussions and prayers and reflections, and we want you to be the center of all of that. 
We don't want to be distracted by our individual agendas or uh, by things that we think ought to be done. We want to hear from you and we want to be led by the things that will grow your kingdom the best, that will grow us into your kingdom the best. So, Lord, we offer ourselves to you uh, in these moments and days and weeks uh, to help us figure out what it means to be your people uh, in the best possible way. And Lord, uh, we also want to offer our prayers for those uh, in our community that are still struggling. Uh, Lord, we all know people uh, in the hospital, people struggling with cancer, uh, people just having a rough time with the resurgence of COVID or with the heat or many of the other thousand natural shocks that our flesh is heir to. And Lord, we just pray that you would be the great physician, that you would be the great provider for them, that you would be healing uh, Lord, it's uh, difficult for us to let you take your time to do the things that you are going to do in the way that you do them. So give us patience uh, to wait uh, as you are working your redemption, both physically and spiritually in the lives of those that we know and love. And Lord, as we uh, approach your scripture, uh, we pray against again that you would speak to us through it, that you would inform us in ways that form us to be your people. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen and amen. It is, I think, my favorite and most frustrating thing about being a teacher. And that is that we teachers have an incredibly ambiguous view or uh, criterion of success. I don't know if you ever thought about that. I know there are a lot of teachers in here. Um, but. When you talk about someone who is a successful teacher, um, there's a number of different metrics you could use to do that, but a lot of them just fall really flat for me. I mean, if I were to come up with a list of the things that I could accomplish in any given day or in any given week or even in a whole school year, and if I were to say I had checked off all of the things on that list, I had gotten through all of the scope and sequence that the Monroe County District wanted me to do in chemistry, that I had graded X number of papers, that I had prepared X number of lessons, I could check off all of those things on that list. But I feel like I would still have a hard time identifying myself as a successful teacher merely by the accomplishment of tasks. It, it doesn't seem like there's enough things that I could do to be a successful teacher if none of my students learned anything. I could get through the whole curriculum and I may have a whole group of students that don't understand things any better than they did when I started. And one of the fun and frustrating things about being a teacher is the recognition that your success as a teacher is entirely wrapped up in the success of your students. That our job as teachers, which is often a lot our job as parents too, is to empower our students to succeed. Whatever that might mean, in whatever context, we are in some sense professional empowerers. When you think back on your teachers, you think about the ones that helped you become you the ones who helped push you forward. And that's what we do. And a successful teacher is a teacher who has successful students. Students accomplish things, and we get to share a little bit in their success. And that, that's a fun and wonderful part about being a teacher, but it's also extremely frustrating if for no other reason than this one big one. Once I recognize that my job as a teacher is to empower my students and that anything I would want to call success only comes because they are succeeding, I have to hold my conception of time really, really gently. I can sit down at the beginning of the year and I can plot out exactly how I will hope all of the things will go and that how we will go through all the curriculum and anyone who's been a teacher will just smile and laugh and know, <laughs> right. Because students don't follow your time schedule. They just don't, they just, 
won't ever do things on the time schedule that you think would be the optimal time schedule. And like every day, every week, every month, teachers are constantly making decisions. Do we just push through this material and get it done? Task accomplished, check. Or do we slow down a little bit, get everybody on board and help them get what they can get and move forward? You've gotta be patient to be a teacher. You've got to engage in time from the student's perspective. That's what it means to empower them, to kind of just loosen up a little bit, sometimes a lot, on our agendas of how fast things should go and the pace that things should take, and focus on what's best for them. How fast can they go? Where can they get? And I think that's what makes some teachers successful. Last week we were looking at Genesis chapter one. And we were looking at the fact that God, in all of God's power and majesty as a creator, functions primarily as one who empowers. Yes, God sets all of the stage on which creation will play out. He creates light and dark and the moon and the sun and creates all the structures. But then, again and again and again, God begins to empower God's creation to be creative. We looked at that. We looked at the fact that God doesn't just sort of poof, 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 magic kind of stuff. God commands the earth to be creative and the earth is creative and he works in and with his creation in order to allow it to become. He gives animals the ability to produce others after their own kind. He gives plants the ability to brew seeds after their own kind, empowering each generation to be an empowerer for the next one. We saw that, right? We saw that God works with God's power in very empowering ways. But just like us as teachers, for parents, that means something very significant for the way God deals with time. That means something significant for the way that God deals with time. And so I want to spend a little bit of time this morning looking at that lens through Genesis chapter 1. We'll actually begin into Genesis chapter 2. Same territory we covered before, but with a little bit different lens, because as we are trying to think about what it means to be a part of God's program in the world, as we are trying to allow God to be empowerers of us, as we are trying to think about what it means to be God's representatives and agents in the world, we're eventually gonna get to talking about what that means in terms of the doctrine of holiness. We've gotta get in our head a much more biblical view of God's approach to time. I don't wanna read the entire uh, creation narrative again, but I just want to highlight a few things as we look at Genesis chapter one. You remember the whole way that the pattern works, right? And God said, let there be, or earth bring forth, and it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, day one, day two, day three. You know how all of that pattern went. A Couple of special days, though, I want to highlight when we think about God's perspective as an empowerer with time. The first one is day four of creation. That happens in verse 14 of Genesis chapter one. Um, that's where God says, let there be lights in the dome of the sky. Again, that's a sort of direct creative action of God. Lights be uh, is literally how they say that in the original language. Let them separate day from night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights on the dome of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the lesser light to rule the night, the greater light to rule the day and the stars. And set them in the dome of the sky to give light on the earth and rule over the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. We'll come back to that. Then I want you to move to the very beginning of chapter two, because remember what I said yesterday when we just looked at the first six days of creation, the creation wasn't done yet. When we're looking at all the stuff that God makes, God finishes all the stuff on day six. There are no new things that come about, no new arrangement of physical things that come about, but creation is not a six day creation. Creation is a seven day creation. 
And it's very instructive to see what God is doing and creating on that seventh day. So if you look at Genesis chapter 2, beginning with, the, with verse 1, uh, and this is part of that chapter 1 story. The real break happens probably about Genesis 2, 4. But at the end of the sixth day, and there was evening and there was morning, day 6, Genesis 2, 1 says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from the work that he had done in creation. And these are the beginnings of the heaven and the earth when they were created. There's just a few little pieces here that I want us to think about and put together when it comes to thinking about how God, the great, almighty, omnipotent creator of everything, deals with this time-bound world that God created. Now, I know that there is lots of kerfuffle and uh, fuss for many people in looking at the time issues in the first chapter of Genesis. One of the unfortunate things that we have to deal with with the Bible is the Bible doesn't come with a reader's manual. It doesn't come with instructions on how to read the book. So lots of different people have lots of different ideas about the best way to approach that. And this is one of those places where uh, people get their, uh, I don't know what you want to say. They, they just get uncomfortable because certain people are saying one thing and certain people are saying the other thing. And so obviously you have people who believe that the best way to read these passages is as literal as possible. And we're talking about the unfolding of creation in seven 24 hour periods. And then you have other people say, no, that's not really what's going on here in the scripture, and it's perfectly fine if God decided to take millions or billions of years to accomplish this thing of creation. The important thing is this is how God is ordering the world. Um, I don't want to get into any of those debates. Uh, there are reasons why people believe things on both sides, but everybody can agree on something here, and that is the fact that creation takes some time. Now, whether it's seven days or 13 billion years is not really as relevant as the fact that God takes time to make the earth. Just think about that. I mean, a lot of people say, wow, isn't God great that God created the world in six days or seven days? I'm like, God's omnipotent. If God wanted to create the entire world in a microsecond, he could have done it. Right? I mean, God's power is all power. If God had wanted to create the world in an instant, he could have, but he didn't. He took some time, seven days, 13 billion years. Either way, creation doesn't happen all at once. It happens over time. God does something and finish it. And God does something and finishes it doesn't have to do that. The God of all power is not at all constrained by time. God has an infinite number of moments between all of the moments that we have. God is not bound by this. It's certainly not because God needs to like, you know, carefully plan and get everything done. I mean, we have to take time to do stuff because we are time bound creatures. God is not a creature and God is not time bound. God can do everything in an instant, but God doesn't. And that alone, that alone is a significant recognition of how it is that God is going to be working God's power into the world. He's going to take time. He's going to do it according to a pattern, according to an order, not because God needs it, but because that's how God made the creation. If God is going to work with the structures of a time-bound and physical world, then God is going to have to commit God's self to taking time to do it. 
And again, that just shows us God's primarily interested in empowering and working in God's creation, not just accomplishing tasks. God can accomplish all the tasks. He doesn't need any of us, doesn't need a creation. Do that. Boom, 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 and it's done. But God doesn't do it that way. God takes time so that God can work in and with God's creation to allow creation to be a part of its own unfolding. Earth, put forth plants. Earth, bring forth animals. Waters, team with fish. So that's, that's one recognition that I want us to see right away. God takes God's time. That's a useful reminder. Because ironically enough, it is we time-bound creatures who always want to be in a hurry. We're always wanting God to work yesterday, please. We're always wanting it done already. And it's God who's like, chill. Or I believe in the Bible, he puts it this way, be still and know. I'm the one who's God. Be still and know that I'm the one who is God. And again, we, we tend to, even when we sing that and think about that, we think of the be still in this sort of nice, worshipful way. Sometimes I think God's the parent of a toddler when he, when he says those things to us. Hey, be still. You're running around, you're doing a whole bunch, you're trying to accomplish stuff, and you're missing things. I'm not in a hurry. Don't be. I think that might be a relevant reminder for us as we're trying to parse through what it is that God wants for us as individuals and for, as a community to remember God's not in any rush. God takes God's time. Then go look at day four, the other day that we read there. Um, and look at how it is that God is beginning to do God's ordering work. But on day four, the ordering work is primarily a work of ordering time. God creates the sun and the moon on day four. Yes, that does raise an interesting question of what a day even meant on one, two, and three when there's no sun around. But light's been around. But on, and because light has been around, when day four comes along, the primary purpose for the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars is not to give light. They are assigned that role, but that's the second thing they do. If you look at verse 14, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate day and night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. That the celestial objects that God creates, their fundamental purpose, although they are also assigned the task of now bringing the light that had been in place since day one, their primary purpose is to order time. To order time. Signs and seasons and days and years. To give time its rhythm, its regularity. To allow the marking of its passing. Again, God doesn't need any of that stuff. But God's time-bound creatures do. Time is not God's enemy. God doesn't have any enemies. Time is God's mode of dealing with a world that is not God. Dealing with a created order. And inviting that created order to work with God in the maximizing and growing and goodening of that created order. And it takes place in time. Signs and seasons and days and years. There's a regularity to it. There's a rhythm to it. And that's important. It's important to God because it's important to God's creatures. As time-bound creatures, we can't function well without those orderly rhythms. And all of us know, all of us know those moments when there is too much to accomplish and not enough time. And those times when we feel like time is getting away from us. And we all know the anxiety that we get when, when, when time appears to be loose, not enough, or too much. 
got a whole day off. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. Um, it's not God who needs this stuff. But God knows God's creatures do. And so one of the ordering gifts that God makes in creation is the structuring and ordering of time. The rhythm. No matter how bad your day has been, you get to go to sleep, wake up, and there's a new one. I don't know if you've ever heard that old hymn about uh, morning has broken, uh, like that first morning. And one of the lines is, there is God's recreation of the new day. There's always a new. There's always a, another. There's always a step forward. It's part of the rhythm. We, we do this year by year. We celebrate the newness of spring, the newness of a school year. Can you imagine if you just went relentlessly day after 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 day We couldn't function. We literally could not function. That's not how we're designed. So it's an interesting question about why we keep trying to do that. Why we keep trying to engage in time as if it's an enemy. There's just not enough of it, and it's going to get lost. Rather than seeing it as the part of the rhythm that God has given us. Now, our time is limited. God's is not. But even there, God says, trust me on this one. Because even that's what's good for you. Even that's what's good for you. Things grow, and physical things fade. Everything in God's time-bound world is subject to the deprivations of time as well as its advantage. And that's okay. Things are allowed to have their season and pass. They're allowed to serve a purpose and go. And that's okay. But God is also interested in creating the new and getting a new opportunity, a new generation, a new thing. So understanding that God is not bound by time, but chooses to work with it and has created an orderly set of rhythms that allow us to work with our time-bound status. It's part of God's ordering of creation. And then most importantly is the ordering of God's creation that God does on day seven. Again, all the stuff is done. The heavens and the earth are finished. But the Bible is very clear that God finishes creation on the seventh day. If you have one of those Bible translations that say by the seventh day, they're fudging it. It's very literal in the original scripture. On the seventh day. Creation is finished with the creation of rest. Creation is finished with the creation of rest. I'm going to read the passage again. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all of their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Now, we just sang about it. God does not get weary. God does not grow faint. God does not run out of energy. God does not need to rest. That's not something that God requires. God requires nothing, actually. So what is God doing when God does nothing? What is God doing when God does nothing? Well, remember that the last thing that happens on day six is the human being, right? They're not around for all of the rest of it. They're newly minted creations on day six. And the first thing they see their God doing is resting. Sit down, pull up a chair, let's talk. But we've got, the, no, pull, sit down, pull up a chair, let's talk. There's other days to get stuff done. Let's start with the not doing things. Again, part of the rhythms that God had put into creation are not just rhythms of accomplishment. Yes, God gets stuff done. 
Yes, God is very interested in empowering us so that we can be God's agents in the accomplishment of tasks. But it is our perpetual and perennial temptation as human beings to sort of take God's assignments and run with them, to think that what God is primarily interested in is getting stuff done. If God wanted to get stuff done, he would not be using me. Probably wouldn't be using you either. However you want to look at it, God is not known for God's efficiency. Because I don't think God's primary interest is getting stuff done. And I think the creation story is set up very clearly to point that out to you. We're not about the accomplishment of tasks. Are there tasks to accomplish? Yes. Is there great joy in being a part of God's work in creation? Oh, absolutely. But let's get the priorities straight first. That the rhythm of creation includes the non-accomplishment of tasks. God doesn't need you. And every week, you get to remember that. When the district advisory board uh, was leaning on our district superintendent, Brian, to take his sabbatical that he'd been putting off for two years, they said to him, and he you know, acknowledged it, you need to be reminded that you're not necessary. God doesn't need you. We can get by without you. Go. You need to rest. That's why we call it a sabbatical. Now, you might be physically weary and need that rest. Recovering from COVID has been a bear for me. I was actually down two days this week because I just couldn't stand up and function. And even this morning, I'm a little woozy. If you see me holding on to my pulpit here. Um, so sometimes we do need that physical rest. God never does. But we always need the reminder that it's not about us and God getting stuff done through us. It's not about the accomplishment of tasks. Chill, sit down, be still. Don't do anything. But we, we all do that, right? Because I work on Sundays. <laughs> Saturday is my Sabbath day. And uh, when I went to bed on Friday night, I had this long list of things that needed to get done by Monday morning. And all day yesterday, my list kept tempting me. There's this, this to accomplish. There's this to accomplish. There's this to accomplish. And God had to keep reminding me, this is not your accomplishment day. This is your day to remember, I don't need you to get that stuff done. I was doing perfectly fine before you got here. I will be doing perfectly fine when you leave. Chill out. Spend some time with me. Spend some time in the other relationships that you have. Spend some time just resting because you know you need it. Okay, Lord. Today I will have tasks to accomplish. I'll do those. But yesterday God had to keep reminding me, not today. Rest. When I went to college, um, I took a... Uh, slightly larger than normal load because I'm one of those sort of, you know, Stepford student things. I just love to study. I'd love to read. I read fast. I memorize things well. I can do school. So I, I, I took a larger than normal load my first semester of college, and I was always accomplishing tasks and always trying to get things done and always trying to accomplish tasks and always getting things done. I had 19 hours that first semester. And, uh, and I was pretty well worn down by the end of that semester, going and going, like nonstop going since the end of August. And I remember thinking, man, I don't know if I can keep this up. For, you know. And I remember God very clearly convicting me that first uh, Christmas break of college. You need to learn how to rest. You need to learn how to stop. So I made a commitment to God that I wouldn't do schoolwork on Sunday. That if it didn't get done by Saturday night, it wouldn't get done till Monday morning. And I ruthlessly protected my Sundays when I was in college. Go to church in the morning, come back, read, hang out with my friends. I'd go back to church on Sunday night because there's nothing else that I'm going to be doing. I could just enjoy that. And for one day a week, I had a day where schoolwork couldn't touch me. The tasks couldn't get me. They didn't go away, but I learned to keep them in their place. And I got a lot more done. 19 hours was the fewest I ever took in college. Most of the rest of my semesters were 23 or 24. Not because I learned how to get things more efficient, because I learned how to rest. Most of us are that way. We, we think that being a part of God's project in the world and allowing God to empower us is to get stuff done. 
And we have to constantly be reminded that God doesn't need us to do that. We are invited to take part with God in what God is doing. God delights in sharing God's work with God's children, those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that God makes with us. But we need to remember it's not about us an accomplishment of tasks. God's in no hurry. We shouldn't be. And part of that is also a very clear sense of what the priorities are in creation. Because later on, when Israel is picking up on its Sabbath traditions, it understands that that day belongs to God. In fact, this is the first time the word holy comes up in Scripture. That God literally holyizes the seventh day of creation. He hallows it in the King James, sanctifies it perhaps, if you want that word. First time the word is used. And again, if the word holy means anything at all, it means something that points to and reflects God. I mean, we normally talk about it as set apart, and it is, but it has to be set apart for God, for it to be holy. And the seventh day is set apart for God. How do we set things apart for God? Well, get as much done as you can for God. No, (laughs) that's not how we set ourselves apart for God, by getting all of God's tasks accomplished. God explicitly forbid us from thinking that way. We set ourselves apart for God by just focusing on God. We point to God, not by frenetic activity. Think of the saints that you know. Think of the holy people that you have met. And how many of them are nervous and anxious task accomplishers? Probably zero. How many of them are patient, calm, going with God's flow kind of people? Even when it means getting nothing done. Rest points to God, far more effective than any anxiety can. Because one of the things God creates in creating rest is that opportunity for us to always remember, this is not about me and what I get done. This is about God. God's got control of the timetable. God's got control of the whole system. I don't need to be anxious. I don't need to worry. I don't need to fuss. I don't need to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. That's not my job. My job is to be the agent for God's empowering work when God invites me to do so. And part of that invitation is don't wait, rest. That's why it's important for us to always keep the creation in mind as that seven day creation, not six. Because the creation of rest is part of God's deep rhythm of creation. He'll do this even a little bit deeper with the Israelites when they will create systems to allow for that. Yeah, sometimes they get really fussy about it and we start protecting rules rather than the things the rules were designed to protect. We get off God's track. We know that as a holiness tradition. But when we can fall in with that rhythm, when we cannot be hurried because God is never hurried, we find ourselves able to flow with God's flow, move with God's movement. We find ourselves able to be those agents, even when we're not getting anything done. The great English poet, John Milton, wrote a poem, uh, it's called On His Blindness, in which he's wrestling with the fact that going blind means he's not able to accomplish all of the tasks that he wished that he could accomplish. And he's worried that maybe he's burying that talent that God had given him because he can't can't write. He has to dictate to his daughter to get the poems down. And the sonnet just goes through this wrestling and it ends up with a very famous line after talking about the fact that God doesn't need anybody. He's got thousands of servants. And the line is, They also serve who only stand and wait. 
they also serve who only stand and wait. You know what they call the people who serve us in restaurants? What do we call the people who serve us in restaurants? Waiters. waiters. Why do we call them waiters? When that job was first being done in the houses of noble lords, when you had servants, you waited on tables because your job was to be there when anything was needed to be done. It was not necessarily to do all of the things. So what did waiters spend most of their time doing in the noble houses of England? Waiting. Being there and ready when the master had a task, but not coming up with tasks of their own to do that might distract them from the master's readiness. Not trying to fill out a form and get all the things and check all the boxes. No, their job as servants was to wait on the master. When the master called, they moved. When the master didn't, they waited. We need that reminder sometimes. All of us who really want to follow God really want to do God's work. But we have a really bad habit of getting ahead of God. <laughs> we have a really bad habit of taking that ball and run with it without waiting for God to call the play. So God reminds us in the rhythm of Sabbath, just wait. I'll let you know what you need to know when you need to know it. You're not going to miss an opportunity by listening to God. You're not going to miss out on something because you're waiting for God to give you the go. Be still. Remember that I'm the one who is God. And wait with me. Spend your time with me. And I'll tell you when we're ready to go. Our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your scripture. The reminder, sometimes uncomfortable ones that you give us of who you are and what you want to do in and through us in the world, even when it's nothing. Even when your delight is just spending time with us, as you do on these Sabbathy days. So Lord, help us to practice being your people by waiting on you. Help us to embrace the rests that you have put into creation, the breaks and the pauses the times of non-accomplishment so that we can be all the better prepared to move when you ask us to move, go where you ask us to go. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your
go now in the peace and rest of God to point to the peace and rest of God in a world that desperately needs to see it. Go in peace.